Right, good morning, everyone. I hope you had a lovely weekend, very cold. Um, we have the big, big pleasure today to um, introduce, I have the big pleasure to introduce you to David Sanderson. Um, David is, is a teacher that is lecturing a part of the Development Perspectives module, which is a subject that is given in, in, in the International Master in Sustainable Development Corporate Responsibility, the IMSD, right? Since uh, this is such an interesting lecture, what we decided a couple of months ago is to open this class to several masters. So we have uh, the IMSD, the MIGMA, and the MERME, and plus this is being filmed, of course, with his authorization, so you're becoming popular, David. Uh, David is a professor and director in the Center for Development and Emergency <coughs> Practice in Oxford. <coughs> In the past, he has been regional manager, among other things, uh, for Southern and West Africa at uh, CARE International UK. If you don't know about CARE, CARE is uh, one of the world's leading aid agencies. And in all, David has uh, more than 20 years experience in development and emergency practice in over, the, in over uh, 30 countries. He's a member of several NGO advisory boards and has published articles and papers concerning urban livelihoods and disaster risk reduction. Actually, he was in Nairobi, in Kenya. Uh, he just landed on Saturday, right? And uh, he, he spent there uh, some days doing a project for the, <coughs> for the UN, for the United Nations. So uh, he's going to be spending at EOI three days. The first two hours is this open class, and then the rest of the lectures will be given only to the IMSD in your classroom, guys. And uh, these sessions will be covering um, how to test out tools and frameworks during the development project cycle. So David, it's a big, big pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, guys. And thanks to all the people that is, uh, who, who is watching us by means of the new technologies. Thank you, Ciao. Well, thank you, Eva. C can you hear this? OK. Is, is this microphone on? You can never, I can never tell. Is this on? I, there's no light. Yes. Oh, there is. The light, yes. Thank you. Well, good morning. You can hear me OK? Yeah. Great. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and a real privilege for me. So thank you also for coming. And we have two hours. And let's take a break in the middle for just five minutes to stretch because I don't know about you, but it might be easy to just doze off. <laughs> if I, um, I'm sorry, my Spanish is not a good enough to lecture in, but uh, if I speak too fast, you'll just tell me, just say, yeah, just, just make eye contact and I can slow down. Okay, but most of what I have are, are images, are photographs, okay? And what I would like to talk about really is uh, disasters, so-called natural disasters, that are almost always not natural, they to do with poverty, and vulnerability, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'd like to present to you one idea, really, one central idea. In what you do in responding to a disaster, do you focus on the disaster itself, on the earthquake, the tsunami, the, the volcano, or do you focus on people, okay? So deliberately a bit overly simplistic, but I just want to put that to you. Do you start with the disaster, or do you start with people about the response, okay? And I would like to share with you three disasters. I mean, there are many, unfortunately, in our world. Uh, the recent one in Sendai, in Japan. Uh, I'd like to share some images from, from a visit just two weeks ago. And then also talk about the earthquake in Haiti, two years ago now. Feels like 10 minutes ago, two years ago. Uh, and then we'll take a little break. And I'd like to share with you a project in northern India, in Hamatra Pradesh, about getting ready. Okay, so the first half is putting the disaster in the middle, the second half putting people in the middle. And already I've sped it with my English. It's okay? <laughs> okay, and please, please interrupt me any time, and if this is a conversation, that's, that's always very nice. Okay, all right. Okay, starting with disaster. In the world of disaster management, there are two very simple models, and the joy is they're very, very simple. They're very obvious. And this is the first main one, that to have a natural disaster, a natural disaster, this is my graphics, you need two things, okay? You need the thing that happens itself, like the natural event, like the volcano, the tsunami, the earthquake. But what you need also is to have people living in the wrong place, 
the vulnerability. And the definition of disaster from the United Nations, the World Bank, all NGOs, is really a disaster of two things, okay? So at the bottom, a disaster is when you get the hazard and the vulnerability. And that's wonderful because it's so simple and so easy, but it really underpins an awful lot of disaster management thinking. Because what that means is, while you can't do very much about the volcano or the earthquake, you can do a bit but not much, you can do a lot around reducing vulnerability, making us less, you know, something bad happening. And in the world of disasters and development, where the two come together, it's often around vulnerability. Okay? Very simple. But a wonderful starting point. So if you stick to that, it's a really good starting point. And that's the disaster. That's what I can think. Let's get that. So not do it. I think that one more time. All right, okay. So I just want, I just want to share with you um, some images from uh, Sendai, the big uh, tsunami, the earthquake that happened in Japan on the 11th of March, just nine months ago. Uh, and the tsunami, and a tsunami, you're probably knowing, is an earthquake at sea, basically. And the earthquake at sea, the land does that and causes a huge wave. It's not a tidal wave, it's a tsunami caused by an earthquake. Okay, now this was huge. It was the biggest one in, what, 1,200 years at least? This is, exactly, yeah, it is, wow. It's huge, no, I'm with you, it's huge. The last time it was that big in that, in that part of the world was 1,200 years ago. And I was just looking this up last night on the way here. The speed of the wave was 800 kilometers per hour. And that's the speed of an aeroplane. I was actually looking at it on the aeroplane. And the speed of my aeroplane coming was the same speed as the wave. Can you imagine? And at its highest point, it was 130 feet, 40 meters high. So it's almost beyond belief. And it came in six miles, 10 kilometers, into the coast of northeastern Japan, up there. OK? So this was huge. I mean. You can't really prepare for that. It's so huge. Well, you can, but you'd spend all your budget and you'd have no money left, okay? So you prepare for a disaster every 1,000 years, every 100 years, every 50 years. You make these <coughs> economic decisions. Now, Japan is probably, I don't know what you think, the most prepared country in the world. It's hard to think of anywhere more ready for a disaster. And still, Japan, super wealthy, very, very clever at disasters, actually was overwhelmed by this. Some 15,800 people killed. That's my next one. And in Sendai, up in the north, 950 people died. And still some people are missing. The cost of rebuilding, the biggest rebuilding ever anywhere on the planet right now, $235 billion. That's an eye-watering amount of money. Okay, and a very old saying that you'll see written is that if you feel an earthquake has happened, get ready for the tsunami. Because the earthquake was several minutes. And just go on YouTube, you may have seen many of the films. I'm not going to show you one because there are so many, so many images of what happened. Okay? So very big, very bad. And I'm just sharing this with you because uh, I, I just went there two weeks ago, so it's, it's fresh to show you. These are not my images. These are from, these are from uh, Google. Uh, but you can see the size of the wave above <coughs> the trees, and that was even coming down a lot from being much higher. Okay? And then this was the... This is the airport at Sendai, Sendai Airport. And so much stuff just pushed in, coming in some miles into, uh, into the land. Then you see these odd things. You see buildings, and you see a ship. It's really weird. It's like, it's like a movie, isn't it? It's like a horror movie. And you see very odd things. So you've probably seen these images. You've probably looked at them, OK? So this is just nine months later, just to share with you. And bear in mind, this is a country that's really prepared. These people are better than anybody. If there's a slight tremor on the ground, if anyone has a mobile phone, the mobile phone goes off to tell you the warning and what to do. People's mobiles go all the time if there's a tremor. And there are thousands every month, <coughs> tremors, little tremors. So this is just, well, this is two weeks ago, nine months later. Just driving into Sendai, it feels fine. People have pretty much cleared up. Sendai is a medium-sized town. A lot of clearance has happened. Then you start to see some odd things. Uh, at first, you see the odd building with not much damage, you know, just a little bit of some of the roof tiles came off because they were very prepared. They were ready for it. And then some other things, some very odd things. There's a, there's a train on the side of a road you know, in the second most industrialized economy in the world, the richest one. And then you see boats along the road as well. <coughs> and this is a, grou a group of us went. And we were hiring a car. And you see the blue line at the top there? That blue line was the, the height of the water that came in into Sendai. 
And so these people remember that by putting a sign, you know, this was the height of the water that affects this very rich economy. Okay. And then just getting a bit more in, uh, well, not more in, this was the airport. And my story here is how incredible a very sophisticated economy is. And we'll talk about Haiti in a moment. But what you can do. The airport, this was the airport on March 11, March 12, day after. This was the airport on the 13th of April. It opened up three, four weeks later, five weeks later. That's amazing. You know, so it's all about government's ability to recover, about wealth, about organization, about being less vulnerable, your ability to recover uh, if you're ready for a disaster. Okay, so this is at the coast. This man was on the front cover of my presentation. This was very powerful. This man is from the government, and he was showing us around. And we're up on a hill, and you, you probably guess what, what I'm going to say. He's pointing at where we're standing, okay? And nine months before, this was a town, okay? We're right at that point. And you can see behind, this is where the town was. So this, this, this would have been people and buildings and cars and dogs and bus stops and post office, <coughs> and there's nothing. It's, there's nothing. There's maybe the odd one building a little bit of things sticking up that didn't get blown away, pushed away. And the coast is just a bit further over. And the whole place was just, it just stopped existing. The most extraordinarily powerful thing. Okay. Now on the coast, driving a little bit further in, you see evidence, um, the piling up of old cars. Just old cars were all over the place, or well, new cars. Cars that were damaged or their owners had died or they're destroyed now. And so cars are piled up. It's, it's, it's a very strange place to be. Uh, some of the ground, the ground turns to liquid in an earthquake. They call it liquefaction. And it becomes like a wave. It becomes like water. And then you see evidence of where it stayed. Um, I'm curious to know, apart from the destruction, is there a lot of radioactivity still there for space to go visit? Ah, this is at Fukushima. There were the, the nuclear plants. Yeah. Around, to my best knowledge, um, around the nuclear plants, you, you need to keep away 40, 50 kilometers. I, we didn't go for good reason. But yes, you're right. The, on the news, the, the nuclear plants that, that, that were really damaged are very dangerous. But, but you were far away from it. Far away enough. Far enough. We flew over it, actually. Or around it, you could see. But uh, Fukushima is a different place. Happy not to go. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so this is Sendai, just a little bit further down. Okay, yeah, so the cars piled up. Some buildings left standing, but just the ruins, liquefaction. Just, you, you get the idea of what happened. Okay, a lot of clearing up and of sorting. You see, just nine months on, lots of piles of, of stuff, industrialized stuff. Uh, you see these places everywhere. People removing things, pushing. <coughs> Behind here, in fact, was a cemetery. And uh, people not quite sure what to do about that. Do you move the bodies? Do you keep them there? The decision wasn't clear yet what to do there. Uh, this was a, a painting uh, someone had done of, of what they see now at the window, but some hope with some images. And this is a list in the city council office of people who are still missing. Okay? No, missing, and then as those people are found or confirmed, then they're ticked. So there are, there are echoes of what happened. And what happens also, a lot of non-governmental organizations, charities, get very involved. People come from all over the world or in Japan, depending on how the government allows for external <coughs> support. This one NGO, really interesting. And we'll come back to this word, um, which I've not written there, around dignity, when we spend a lot of time doing our, our workshop together. Uh, we'll talk about where's the dignity about people's lives. Uh, are they victims? Are they just human beings where something very bad has happened to them? Well, they're the latter. And this non-governmental <coughs> organization has been very carefully collecting what might be valuable belongings that belong to people. And valuable meaning photographs and photo albums. And they're collecting not gold or money or of money value, but things that have emotional value. That's very powerful. And this large room here, this organization has very carefully sorted information that might be valuable to people. And they want to document it, put it online, make it a resource around people's lives. And there's an emotional tie here of individuals and their lives clipped in bags and, and hung up, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a powerful place to go. Okay, 
This is a man, this man here, he lived in America for many years. He's from Sendai, classic story. He wanted to come and help. You know, his hometown had been destroyed. So he wants to come help. So he came back and he set up a community radio station because his background is in radio. And it's just, um, it's not web-based radio, it's just a short, short distance around Sendai. But he does music, advertising, in public information, all that kind of stuff. And you see that happening. Small efforts of individuals who come to help after a disaster. And sometimes it can be really good, but then too often you get too many people coming. And this was a problem in Haiti, and you get a mess. And the coordination becomes a problem. But sometimes it's nice. And this is a very simple, very small thing about setting up a radio station. OK. So far, OK, so far so good? Not too fast? OK. All right. This, um, this is a big school. And we spent the morning in this school on our visit. And out of that window, which was on the third floor, people could see the tsunami coming. And it was higher than the trees uh, on the coast. And the tsunami came. And the children stayed in the school. And because there was a warning of maybe one hour between the earthquake and the tsunami, and in a tsunami, the water goes out, you know? And then the, the water goes out, and then it comes back in. So you get some warnings. Not unlike, unlike some other disasters, earthquakes, you get a warning of a tsunami. And this was an evacuation point. So about two, 300 people came to the school because it was a strong building. There were already stores in there. There was food and water and clothes and blankets ready for when the tsunami comes. comes. Because people remember there was a very bad one in 1978, a long time ago. But people practice every few months what to do to be ready. If there's a tsunami warning, you go to that school. Now, some of the people who didn't go to that school died. But those who went to that school all survived. And the water came up to there. It was just the top of the first floor. Uh, and then the whole of the ground floor was destroyed. And then you see boats and all these strange things. <coughs> And the people in there were there for two, between two and three days. And a helicopter came and picked them up and took them off. And they were lucky because they were safe. But because of good preparedness, they were ready, OK? Ready for the disaster. Now this stuff, you see these things, cars, tractors, motorbikes. This is the, the stuff that gathered uh, because of the wave coming in. All this machinery gathered in the ground floor of the school. And they put it outside the school. And this is the car park, OK? and then starting to sift and to organize and to sort. OK, just a couple of more images. Uh, this was um, uh, a gym. And the gym, the roof of the gym is fine and is OK. The whole of the ground floor is destroyed. And I don't know if you can see that, but the ground was really strange. It was like being on the sea. And the sea had frozen. And the ground is like this, moving. Well, it stopped now, but it was moving at the time. And this liquefaction, this movement, this earthquake, and this place has just stopped solid. And it's very strange. What about the people there? Like, how do you feel like, what kind of feelings do they have about it? And how they move on from people? It's a good question. So what kind of feelings people have? What, what do you imagine? Right. So just if you can't hear about it, you need to move forward and be positive, you're saying. Yeah? Yeah? That, that would be good. Yeah. Doubtless some people are. They're often trauma, you know, a lot of trauma. You often get a lot of fear after an earthquake. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Yes. Yes. So your whole world changes. Absolutely. We often talk about... Go ahead. I, I just want to say that um, I had a Japanese friend in my class, and she was really worried about her family. And she was surprised because her mother, who lives in Japan, after the earthquake, she got a, a renewed sense of life, and she signed up for language classes and realized that life is short, so she had to wow. tell the things she wanted. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's powerful. I mean, how would you, I mean, maybe some people have been in bad things happening, and I'm not asking you to talk about that. But, I mean, it must be every different experience. Some people get on, some are positive, some are stuck, uh, and then some people change their lives. 
I, I don't know what you would do if you were in that situation. I don't know what I would do. But I do know that seeing people been in an earthquake, there's a lot of fear. And because there were so many tremors, there were some 400 aftershocks in Japan. So imagine this happens, and then the ground does that again. Uh, when I was there, I mean, the building shook for about 20 seconds we were in. The building shook. And it was very interesting watching people around. Some people didn't even notice. It was a restaurant, because it happened so often. Other people are like that. You know, and then other people, well, they didn't run out, but if it continued, we would have run outside. If there was an earthquake now, here, what would you do? Run. You'd run. <laughs> Good. Where would you run? I'd run to the nearest exits. Okay, where are the nearest exits? Do you know? Okay. Good. So there's, there's a little one there. <laughs> you could form a queue. <laughs> okay, we could all go out slowly. But lots of big exits there. Yeah, salida, salida. Exits, there's exit there. You know, that's preparedness, all right? That's, that's what we've learned as human beings through other fires in other places like this where there weren't the exits. Oh, you see the handle there, that bar that you push? Someone will know this story better than I, but oh, you might know. No, it's a good point. The, the, you, you have the phrase crying wolf. Do you, do you know that phrase? Yeah. If you cry wolf and the wolf doesn't come, cry wolf, the wolf doesn't come. You cry wolf and the wolf does come. You think it won't come. Yeah. And it's a real balance about issuing warnings for disasters. It's a real balance because if, you don't, if the disaster doesn't happen, then it's a problem. But with an earthquake on the coast, if the earthquake's at the sea, there will almost certainly be a tsunami if it's a size. And you can predict uh, a tsunami after an earthquake, but you can't predict earthquakes. Uh, no technology right now. So, so the question is, uh, is it, are there cultural differences? I think if you live in a country where there are many disasters, then of course, as a society, you're prepared for it. Okay, I think that's certainly true. But do you think there's much difference between human beings? I don't think so either. I think we all have the same. You're nodding quite a bit. <laughs> is that you? So if we're not prepared, yeah, and I'm with you. If we're not prepared and something bad happens, then obviously it's worse. You're prepared, Spain's prepared, this room's prepared, okay? But if there was an earthquake, I'll just finish this. Uh, here, uh, what kills people are buildings collapsing on people's heads. That's, that's what causes death, and then the fires that happen after. So I'm with you, I'll follow you out, okay? Because <laughs> you said you're gonna leave and I'm gonna rush with you. So if you can, we get out, we go to evacuation points. And if not, some people will say, get under here. Others will say, that will crush you even more. Uh, but some people say, go to the side. So if something falls, you create this triangle of space. Okay? Many people say, do that. But if you can get out to a safe place, get out. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, sorry, you were, uh, excuse me. Yes. But the, the tsunami didn't expect that it's going to come in that far. 
Yes. You're right. And because it was so big, it was nine on the Richter scale, it was the biggest one in 1,200 years. So for the one for every 500 years, we're ready. But the 1,000, it was so big. Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, and just written on the wall, hope for tomorrow. This was a final drawing, writing somebody had written in the school. Okay, so I wanted to talk, just opening, to talk about, well, a terrible disaster, this is true but a positive one uh, in terms of a society being very prepared. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about Haiti. Uh, and you're knowing Haiti, you remember the earthquake from two years ago. Okay, now I need to change to my other PowerPoint to do this, but it's all ready. Okay, and I want to sh share with you a piece of work from a year ago. Okay, now this was a study that uh, four of us carried out a year ago. And if you search for it online, you will find the report, okay? And I'll tell you about it. But I want to tell you about the findings. It's a bit wordy. It's very long-winded. This is the title we were given for our research uh, on this. And the basic question was, what can we learn for the next <coughs> urban disaster, okay? Because you know, you, you'll, you'll know that half the world now lives in towns and cities. We changed, what, a couple of years ago, maybe? A year ago, something like that. Half the world now lives on planets. And do you know how fast cities are growing every week? Now, actually, every day, I, this, I got this fact from the UN last week. Every day, 95,000 more people are in cities, every day. So that's just under a million people a week, okay? So this time last week, there were just under a million people. There were a million people less living in towns and cities around the world. So cities are growing quicker than it's almost even possible to imagine. A million people a week. Almost unbelievable. Okay? It's currently mostly in countries in Africa and Asia and Latin America. Okay? And Africa is some, no one really knows, but people think Africa is probably the most quickly urbanizing continent. Okay? <laughs> so I don't know what you think when you think of Africa, of trees and land and, you know, grass and nothing and elephants. Well, it's changing now. It's cities. It's people living in towns and cities. And it's people living uh, mostly as poor people. There are a billion people living in slums and in squatter settlements. And the UN thinks that maybe 2 billion in 15, 20 years' time. Okay? So we're living in a world of real change. And so this study was around what can we learn for the next urban disaster. Okay? Because there will be many more. All right? And many cities aren't prepared. And if you work in the aid world, an awful lot of our tools are based on rural thinking, <laughs> working in the countryside. We talk about working in the field. And we're not working in the field anymore. We're working in the slums and in the squatter settlements. And that's the big shift. Well, one of the big shifts. So I want to talk about this study. Why was Haiti so bad? Japan so good. Haiti so bad. Okay, the earthquake in Haiti was, it'll come up, but I'm pretty sure it was much smaller, okay, than the one in Japan. Someone know? Was it eight? Yeah, okay. So it was smaller than the one in Japan, and yet it killed so many more people. <coughs> and then I want to, these are our ten recommendations for what to learn. We were asked to do this study for the Disasters Emergency Committee, which in the UK is a collection of, it's now 14 biggest NGOs uh, working in aid and development. So we had access to all their files, their work, their stories, and they spent £100 million, 104 million pounds. $160 million in Euro, way more. <laughs> but we don't talk about the Euro because I'm English. <laughs> okay, all right. So it was, you know, quite a, quite a bit of money, okay? Uh, this is global urban growth, by the way. This is 1950, you probably can't see it. This is 2050, this, this answers your question over there. Um, the line at the top is global urban growth. These are the richer countries, the bottom line, and the blue line is countries, our countries in Africa, in Asia, and Latin America. And their urban growth, just going like that. Nine out of 10 of every new person being born on the planet is being born in towns and cities, okay? So that's our shift. So we were asked to look at it. What can we learn for the next urban disaster? That was our study. I don't think we need to look at that. I would suggest. 
Uh, these are my three colleagues we did it with, and I put this up for several reasons. Uh, it was important for us, we, we put a bid in for the project, we won it, is that it was gender mixed, it was men and women, or men, just wrong, or women, or wrong, because you don't get access and understanding if you don't have a balance of the two. Okay? Um, Anshu Sharma from India, <coughs> Helen who lives in Haiti, Karine Clement who's Haitian. Now it might seem very obvious to do a, an aid study with people from that country, but it's very unusual, funnily enough. And when we had our first meeting in Port-au-Prince, in the capital, we met with all the aid agencies from DEC. There were about 30 people in the room. And the only person in the room from Haiti was, was Karine Clement, which is very odd, don't you think? That the NGOs we work with, those in senior management, are often not from the country where the disaster takes place. There were, there were none in this grouping. Very strange. A bit of an aside, but it's still, I think we'll unpack it a bit in our, in our two-day meetings. So we spent a lot of time visiting, talking to people, doing things, and all that stuff. Uh, we got caught up in some, some of the politics I'll talk about, but um, yeah, it was very big. But this was the disaster, January 2010, seven on the Richter scale, much smaller, nine in Japan. And that doesn't mean twice as much, That's, it's exponential, ten times, ten times, ten times. So Japan was much bigger. Now, the number of people killed in Haiti varies a lot, okay? The official statistic from the government of Haiti is 316,000 people, okay? The U.S. government thinks it might be between 60 and 70,000 people. Often, a figure you often heard was 223,000. So we said over 220. We think that might be that. But, you know, it's in the interest in the government of Haiti to say more people died because there's more aid needed. Um, and you often find one of the <coughs> casualties of disaster are the figures, the statistics, because it's really complicated. Okay? All right. But we can agree it was very big and very bad. Now, Japan, that, that could have been Japan. But the clear up in Japan was super quick, okay? And a lot of buildings stayed up that were stronger. These aren't my images. These are, again, from Google, these two pictures. But the scale of devastation was so much bigger in Haiti because, of course, well, why do you think? Very simple question. Why do you think it was worse in Haiti? What about it? Sorry? <coughs> the cities weren't prepared, yeah. Weak infrastructure. It's also about development. I mean, those countries don't have the resources to build uh, good structures. Yes. In Haiti, the structures are very primitive. Even most of the houses don't have roofs when you're landing. So that gives you an idea of uh, what kind of, uh, how, how can you be prepared to those situations? Exactly, yeah. So primitive, as you say, a development issue. Yes. Thank you for saying that, because we haven't said that yet. The time of day when disasters happen. At night, you're in your house, asleep, obviously, most part, and then something might happen. If it's a market day, you'll be in the market. If it's a morning, children going to school. The Gujarat earthquake was in the morning uh, on, a, on a day of a big festival, 2001. So more people were killed because they were together in some of the main buildings. So timing, maybe. But OK, so the reason why Haiti was so bad, of course, well, there it is, is its poverty. Uh, it, the link between being very poor and being more vulnerable is very, it's not exactly the same at all, but it's, but it's very similar. If you're poorer, you're almost always more vulnerable to a bad thing happening because the buildings are built less well. There's corruption. There are so many things that are bad. The disaster exposes, and a natural disaster exposes poverty. Yeah? It puts a, a torch on people who are poor or societies that don't work very well. Okay, and things are bad. Now this man, he's no longer the head of this. This was a UN body, the <coughs> International Strategy for Disaster Reduction. He said it very clearly the day after the earthquake. It's poverty that's at the core of these disasters. You may remember there was a disaster in Chile six weeks later. You remember that? Yeah. Ah, right, okay, right. The disaster in Chile six weeks later, the earthquake was 500 times more powerful. 500 times more powerful, and it killed 700 people. <laughs> now that was still awful, but it was so much bigger and so many less people were killed. Chile is, I think, the best country with the infrastructure and education. 
Yes. That's what I'm saying. The earthquake was much bigger, but so much less damage happened because Chile was very prepared. So now I'm with you. On the Human Development Index, a measure of poverty, that's 49th. Uh, Haiti is 149th, actually, funnily enough. Okay, so yeah, so that your, your point is exactly that. Yeah, better prepared. So we don't need to read all this, but basically half the people in Haiti live on a dollar a day, whatever it is, 80% on $2 a day, something like that. Just super poor, okay? Years of political problems, it gained independence, what, 1804, something like that. They had to pay for 100 years money to their colonial powers for their freedom. Uh, you know, the tiny number of families own a huge amount of the country. All kinds of systemic problems around the way the country is managed. And it's a huge problem, okay? So it was no surprise that the disaster was very bad. Okay? So far, so good? Yeah. Okay, Chris, just checking. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, there's some images. You know why this building fell down and the one next to it stayed up? Who knows, okay? It shouldn't have happened, you know? The building codes are good. This building shouldn't have fallen down and the one that stays up next to it does. But that's what happens. Maybe the cement was built badly. There was something wrong with the building. You know, maybe a bit of bribery. Maybe someone didn't bother to check that it was well built. It fell down. This, I put this up because this was the office of a... Um, of a non-governmental organization, uh, uh, CRS, I think, or Concern. Now, the point I make here is that in Port-au-Prince, NGOs that were already there, their buildings fell down too. They were also victims. An Oxfam, which is a big NGO, 600 people working for them, 100 people were living in tents. Okay? They were also affected by the disaster. So those aid agencies that tried to help were also badly affected. Okay? All right. This is by no means... Do you know Haiti? Are you familiar? I understand it, but saw it and it was incredible what I saw. Right. Okay, yeah. I know so from Venezuela, which is poor, but I mean the level of poverty in Haiti is something like uh, we're, we're so beyond them and most of them were also behind the world. It's yeah. incredible. Poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, Haiti. Yeah. So um, this is by no means a dense or a busy or a worst area in Port-au-Prince. Absolutely not at all. But what you see here... Well, first thing you see is, is that it looks very dry. You'll see some trees here, but one of the problems in Haiti is the deforestation. The, yeah, a lot of, oh, you, you guys are doing the environmental course, yeah? So a lot of deforestation up on the highlands, okay? A lot of trees cut down, so when the rain comes, it washes away the soil and the earth. And you see a lot of dryness, obviously some trees there, but not so many. A lot of buildings collapsed. After disasters like this, you see blue tarpaulin, Blue, blue plastic in many places, which is a really useful material, okay? But you see, places washed away, all right? Now, one of the problems with the places being washed away is where the rubble goes, all the, all the broken buildings and all the dirt and all the stuff, and a lot of that rubble has been moved into the storm drains, okay? And it's in the storm drains. So when the rain comes, there's nowhere for the rain to go, and the flooding, and these things knock on each other. But what you see in Haiti is, say, this is a year ago to the day, this time last year to the day, in fact. Uh, a lot of people are moving rubble, large amounts of this, and putting it somewhere. But where do you put it? Because there's hundreds and thousands of tons of it, and not so many of these um, removers. After the disaster, and the aftershocks, and the fear, so many people built their own temporary camps, okay? I would do the same, I think you might do the same too. You just go live outside, because it's so frightening to be in a building because of the aftershocks. And there are thousands of camps that have been set up by people with whatever material you can find. Just build, just do something, okay? Because there has been a lot of aid. A lot of aid has not been good. I'll show you some. But a lot of people have just got on with their own lives. How do you manage security inside these camps? It's a really good question because it's a huge problem. Security in camps uh, is, is a huge problem. Uh, of theft, of abuse, uh, attacking of girls in particular, uh, and of women. Uh, some aid agencies have put lighting, putting lighting, a very simple thing to do, um, but it's a huge problem, and certainly early on after the earthquake. Yeah, no, no easy answer to that. And if you look at reports by CARE and other NGOs about, about that, you'll, you'll find a lot on the internet. Okay? 
So an awful lot of camps, some were formally organized by aid agencies, but the vast majority, most, were just people getting on with just, you know, surviving, getting to the next day. Um, this is uh, tents uh, given by, by China, all different countries from around the world came, and this is opposite the President's Palace, and I don't know, but it's a pretty safe bet to think these people are still there. Because in Port-au-Prince right now, some 600,000 people, more or less, between four and 700,000, are living outside still, with nowhere to go. Living in tents and in camps, because there's no, where, where do you go now, okay? Or going back to buildings, some of which are, are damaged. Some are safe, but some are damaged, okay? Okay. Um, this is from the balcony of a UN agency called UN Habitat. And they're the aid agency, you're knowing them, responsible for urban, urban work, towns and cities. And this is interesting. The man who was in charge there said, look out the window here, the balcony, and to look at this. And he said, this is a good thing. Okay, what do you see here is a good thing. It's, really? Uh, and what he's saying is it's a good thing is because the people here, he tells me, uh, were people who were there before the earthquake and their buildings fell down. Okay, so they cleared a bit, but they're staying in the neighborhoods where they're from, okay? Now that's really, that might sound surprising to you that that's unusual, but what often happens is that the government comes or, or aid agencies and they take people and put them 20 miles away. So say now, if you, I don't know where you live, but say you lived around here, there was an earthquake, okay, you're living in tents now with nowhere to go, and an aid agency comes and says, you must go and live 30 miles away or 50 kilometers away. You, you must go live over there. You need to leave your family, your jobs, people you know, everything else. You, you go live over there now. I don't know, would that be okay, do you think? Would you be very happy about that? No one's really nodding, no. And that's what happens. And, it, and all the policy, all the wisdom is don't do that. And yet, after almost every disaster, people say, you must go over there, all right? And this policy called safe return, if it's safe to stay, is where you should be. Because what is happening, and not my image, we were not allowed to go there because of security concerns. This is the town of Karai. This didn't exist before the earthquake. And there are easily over 100,000 people here now. And it's horrible, okay? There's no water, well, water is brought in, there are no water pipes, little sanitation, no roads, no jobs. It's about 10 miles away from the city. It's not 100 miles, but it's 10 miles. Now, who knows? Maybe in 20 years' time, maybe we can hope it will be good. We, we hope it will be a good town, but it might not. Do the aid agencies take advantage of the renewable energies, like, like solar panels and so on, to, to help that um, those channels or settlements? I think some do, if you're a specialist NGO, but it's pretty, pretty rare. Pretty rare. Marina, has this been your experience? Or? It's very hard. They do need electricity, they do need... Yes. Um, and it's... And it, it comes when the solar panels are always... To who, who owns it, it's usually household-based, and it's not where do you put it, really? So this needs large-scale solutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that seems a lot of solar panels, very yeah. 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 I, th I think it, it... Some probably do, small NGOs, but it's... There are so many needs. And so this big problem here is now we have 100,000 people living out of the city in what may become a slum of the future. We hope it won't, but it may well do. Uh, and there are so many problems with this. You know, the politics are that the government will think it's okay now. We've put them somewhere else, somewhere to stay, all right? But they haven't. It's creating new problems, healthcare, jobs, water, all those things. Yes. Clever people create markets. And what one of the problems is with aid is that we assume people are helpless victims and can't help themselves. But what you found in Haiti the day after the earthquake were people selling food in streets. The markets have come back up again. 
But there was no pre-existing market here because there was nothing. <laughs> this was literally dust. And, uh, you know, it's well-meaning. It was, you know, the actor, Sean Penn, very involved. You know, it's impressive. You know, he's, it was actually him and some others, well-meaning, it wasn't evil, said, look, there's a lot of people here. There's a lot, ooh, there's a lot of space over there. Uh, let's put them there because it might flood here. Well, it didn't flood, and now there's a problem. And so the well-intended consequences, you know, the consequences are bad. You know, good intent, as we know, isn't enough, all right? So whereas the man in Japan with the radio did something good because he was an expert, th th this is bad. And th this, this will haunt for decades, and it's not unusual. All right, this you see out the window everywhere. Now, this woman is wearing a T-shirt from Oxfam, Quebec. It could be any NGO, all right? Uh, she's wearing a T-shirt because she's part of a cash for work program, okay? And it's very simple. You're in a team of 15 people. You do a piece of work. You clear a street. At the end of the day, you get $2, something like that. And you're allowed to be a member of that work team if you're very, very poor or you're destitute or you've got no home. So that seems like a good thing, right? Yeah, it seems like a good thing. Seems good. It could be a good idea. I was with Karine in the vehicle and we were driving past and I said, you know, I was asking Karine and she was laughing because these people, not, not at the people, but the programs, because one of the problems with a program like this is you wear a t-shirt because you're poor, okay? And it symbolizes you. Yeah, you got it right. Where's the dignity in that? Okay. Sorry? They mark the people. They mark the people, yeah. Yeah, they mark the people. You might as well have a t-shirt saying, I'm really poor and I need your help. There's something about dignity. Now, the NGO didn't, d doesn't do it for that reason, but you might ask a question why, why they have to wear a t-shirt with a logo of the agency on. Sometimes it's advertising, marketing. If the cameras are there, they're seen to be doing work. Now, we need marketing. I'm not saying marketing is bad because it's fundraising and blah, blah, blah. But uh, it's just a question, really, about is this a good thing to be having people really struggling wearing your logo, all right, to advertise the organization. It's, it's one way of seeing it. Others will violently disagree. Maybe we can discuss uh, as a group. Okay, this was um, just, just around governance again, around politics. This man didn't get elected in the end. Mr. Martelli got elected, I think. Um, this was last December. This man, Celestine, was being pushed forward to be the new president. People didn't want him to be president, and so there were riots for days, <laughs> and for days and days, and tear gas and riots. And this settlement here, we're having problems with fire, and every couple of hours, about 200 men went run up and down the street, shouting and screaming. And my point of putting this up is just everyday life is going on around politics while a country is being rebuilt, and there are all kinds of problems to do with government, okay? and aid agencies have to be stopped from working because it's too dangerous. And all kind of, you know, just, you know, life goes on, even in some of the worst situations. Okay, uh, there are 10 recommendations here. You know, I said our study was around what we can learn for the next, for the next urban disaster. Okay, so just 10, and I've, I've made them a bit simpler. But the report's on the website if it interests you. And some of them might sound very obvious to you, okay? And none of the aid agencies we work with, they were a surprise, but often we forget to do this. So the first one, always try and work through the government, okay? Haiti is known as the, the kingdom of NGOs. You maybe heard this phrase, the kingdom of NGOs. NGOs have been in Haiti for 30 years and more or less run Haiti, more or less, not totally, of course not, but have a big power. And a lot of people don't like that. And the parallel systems that happen that can be set up. Now, and everybody knows this, but it's very hard to do. But what we have to do as aid workers is to link and work with government where we can, knowing it's very difficult, okay? And if we don't do that, we continue to create dependency, yeah? And to work as non-elected people, propping things up. And nobody wants that. The NGOs don't want that. So where we can, we must try and work through governments around electoral reform, around working in the systems. Now that's incredibly hard. But if we don't do that, we don't solve the problems, we continue the dependency. Okay. The second one, again, it sounds very obvious, but work with local people. People aren't helpless victims. And it's a huge problem. I'll show you some slides in a minute where we have that mindset and it's really 
silly. Uh, assume people know what they're doing. Find local skills and abilities. Tap into networks. We call it social capital. Skills, abilities, networks, friendships, yeah, all those things. And good aid programs work with existing networks and people and skills. Uh, the bad ones uh, don't and continue dependency. Like, I think you can't do anything because you've been in an earthquake. I will do everything for you. That's frustrating uh, and it's silly and a waste of money. Okay? So always work with people. This is interesting. After the earthquake, lots of problems, aid agencies for, for good reason and for the right reasons bring in a lot of stuff such as healthcare, which is, no one would say that's wrong, or free water supply, free healthcare, free surgery. Okay? That's maybe a good idea. However, one of the problems is that in Haiti forever, you pay for healthcare, even if you're super poor. You pay a nurse or a doctor or a physician, whatever it might be. Now, the bringing in of free healthcare and free water and all these other things undermined the existing situation. Okay? Now, I saw we were taken to a hospital that had just been built, and that hospital was going to have to shut down because it was a private hospital, all right, because of the amount of free healthcare. Now, I'm not saying there's an easy solution there, but there is an issue and a problem around flooding a market with unfair competition, okay, which will damage the long-term recovery. And that's something new maybe for urban. Maybe we didn't have that problem in rural areas so much. Not so much, not so much. But in urban areas, try not to compete with the private sector. It sounds unusual for an NGO to be doing that, but it's a real problem. So this is one of our observations, something to, something to grapple with, to fight with. Okay? Oh, hello. And I mentioned this one before. This is the same image as before. Don't put people in Karai or Terabisa or other places. Keep them in the city because cities are dense. Good cities are cities that are dense and have high rises because they're more efficient and save energy and all those things we know. Compact cities, a whole methodology. Don't spread cities. It's really uneconomic and unsustainable. Concentrate them. And that's what this, this is about. Fifthly, after an earthquake, what's happened in the past, disaster, for all the right reasons, you bring in goods and resources. I'm from the UK. People fly in lots of resources from Oxfordshire and take them somewhere. Well, people were doing that here also. Some of that was good, but a lot was wasted. It got stuck in the ports for months, unable to get at. And one of the big reasons was you could find things in Haiti anyway. You could find things next door in the Dominican Republic. So don't bring in stuff. Assume it exists. So for an urban disaster, assume you can find it. Cities are where the skills are, the elites, where different skill sets, a variety of, of resources and things are, and markets. So try and find them rather than bring it in and flood the market. And that's a change. Okay, this is a huge problem. I could talk all year about this, but I won't bore you to death. Just, just look at what's happening here. After the disaster, aid agencies, many are building buildings like this. Now, these are, these are called transitional shelters. Anybody know this phrase? Maybe not. Nope. Okay, if you have tents and permanent houses, permanent houses are very hard to build and complicated. Land is hard. So build temporary houses designed to last three to five years. Seems like a good idea. Right? It seems like a really good idea, but it's a terrible idea because it's a waste of money and political will and the aid money gets wasted, and I choose my word, in a building that will last three to five years. Now that building people will reuse. We'll go back in 10 years, 20 years. I bet you anything people will be living in them, using them, because people are clever. But the money will have been wasted. The permanent buildings, probably, let's hope we're wrong, will not be there perhaps. And these buildings are very rural. They're single-story, standalone wooden buildings in a dense urban area where normally you would have high-rise buildings. Okay? So it's a problem. Okay? And it's a whole problem around building the wrong kind of buildings in urban areas. Uh, if this interests you, read the report. There's a whole chapter on this. Okay, number seven. Things change really quickly in cities. You know, in the morning, someone's in charge. The afternoon, it's somebody different. The evening, the water's broken. The next day, there's a fire. There's a cholera on Saturday. Things change super fast. And if we make a plan and stick to it, things will have changed so quickly, forget it. And I think there's something urban about that, the speed of change. Okay. Where you can use money 
we're in cities where we believe in markets and commerce and buying and selling. And so in urban areas, in towns and cities, we use cash where we can. And there's a whole world of cash-based market programming that we can learn from. Just two more. Oh, I don't know why I did that. Number nine. OK, we use in aid world an awful lot of rural tools. We're working in the field, and we're not. We're working in urban areas. So do we use planning approaches? Do we use money instead of bringing in food? Do we use permanent housing and pay, I don't know, pay landlords rather than build houses? There's a whole different world of working, and that's urban. Then my final slide on this. Um, this was not a dramatic prediction at all. This is very humble, and it said in the next 10 years. And on the day we were going to launch this report, there was the earthquake in Christchurch in New Zealand. You may remember that one, which was... You were in it? Oh, gosh, right. Okay, right. So, yeah, a very bad thing that happened, you know. Yeah, but yeah. compared to the, the one we are talking about, I refer to New Zealand as close to Japan. Right. Very, very deep for it, very great rescue team after that. And Quick response, very efficient, response, I mean. Very efficient response. Yeah, yeah. They were set in a, in a wild camps for the first aid, like water, food, and yeah. well, people to set tents and whatever. Yes, yes. Yes, very organized, yes, like Japan. Yes, no, thank you. Well, I'm sorry you, you were in that. Well, we were going to produce this report, and that was the day. So we put it back, and then we, we launched it a few weeks later on the Monday, and on the Friday, Japan happened. So this is not a great prediction, but there will be more urban disasters. And this happens to be Shimla in Himachal Pradesh. Has anyone been to Shimla? It's beautiful, but be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll, but we'll talk about that in the second bit. So, what we were talking about before the break, do you remember I, I posed this idea? Do you start with disasters in the middle, and I showed you the diagram, hazard and vulnerability as disaster? Or do you think about people in the middle, okay? It's a slightly artificial separation, but I think if we think about disasters in the middle, people remain helpless victims, but if we start with people, then actually we think, what are your capacity? How can you recover? How do we work together to make it better as opposed to you just receiving lots of things, okay? And I think too often it's the first and too often not the second. He's gone over there now. <laughs> Always back. Okay, all right. <clears throat> and just to recap from before the break, these are just a couple of, just two or three of other disasters. What do you do if you don't think about people in the middle? Now, there was a big earthquake in Gujarat in India in 2001. And after the earthquake, um, a lot of things happened, some good things, some very good things, actually, and some things we could learn from. We could certainly learn from these houses that were built in one particular village. These are permanent houses, and they were built with only the disaster in mind. These buildings would withstand a bomb going off, probably. They're super strong, super heavy. They would withstand anything. So they're good for a disaster, but they're not good for people. And I, I can tell you this with some degree of certainty, having been involved in that. And 10 years later, we revisited. This was from last year to see what they were like now. So 10 years later, some of the houses are being used quite well, actually. But we met nobody who thought the houses were comfortable to live in. They were all too hot. Every house leaked. These were built, uh, 5,000 houses, 23 villages. We visited 10 villages. Uh, pretty much unhappy people. Not bad, but not good for lots of reasons. And I would just say, why? Because the man, the well-meaning man who designed the houses had the earthquake in his head, not people living it in his head, I would suggest. <laughs> okay, and that's written up as a paper if it interests you, uh, the findings from that. Uh, another one, we're just moving quickly here. This is, the top one is in Gujarat also. This is one village, the village of Vond. And the village of Vond has 780 houses and they're empty and they're not used. They're kind of padlocked up, which means that there's a degree of ownership somewhere, but people don't live there. So this was five years ago. We went to try and find the people of Vond. And the people at Vond had rebuilt their own village because they wanted to stay where they are. They didn't want to be moved five miles away. So they stayed where they are and they rebuilt their own houses themselves without the compensation money because it had gone somewhere else. And so they've rebuilt a weaker town. And all the aid money has gone into an empty village. Crazy, isn't it? Because people 
were not being thought about. We didn't think about putting people in the middle. We thought about the disaster in the middle and provided the answer rather than engaged people in the problems themselves. Okay? The bottom one here, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, this is after the tsunami in Tamil Nadu <coughs> in the southeast of India. And the non-governmental organization has rebuilt a village. They've named it after themselves. That's nice. <laughs> and they've put a big poster on the, app, on the front there with the date of the tsunami, the tearful eye of somebody, the tsunami, just to remind you how your uncle, your mother, your father, your children died right outside the houses where you live. And then on every house, there's a sign saying, this is a gift from this NGO, and you should be very grateful to us. And so where's the dignity in that? No. I mean, the, the, I, I don't believe they're evil, this NGO. They're not evil people. But they didn't think, I would suggest, around putting people in the middle. So I, this is not nice, OK? Uh, this is not good practice. And it happens all the time when we don't put people in the middle. Um, can you see that? <laughs> That's a whole new form of urban planning that's gone on there. Now, it might as well say the UK or the USA. I'm not making a point about the donor. Uh, but to, to, to organize your entire settlement in the name of the donor, it's not, that's not good, is it? That's when you put the donor in the middle, all right, when you don't put the organization. That was Jim Kennedy who took that. And then just one more, just one more slide. Uh, this was also Gujarat. Now, I mean, I'm not saying aid is bad. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm putting the contrast when we don't think about getting it right, about how we do it, okay? This, this, this loo built in 2001, same loo 10 years later. I was very proud to find the same toilet <laughs> in a remote part of India 10 years later. Uh, not been used, not been used, useless. Had the name of the NGO, the, the name of the donor. Not used because people weren't asked Where's the ownership? Just a waste of money. Uh, this was a health clinic uh, built in a village. Quote, not used from day one. Never used. Because the well-meaning A project built the clinic. We need clinics. But didn't link in with the government. So where are the doctors coming from? Where are the nurses? Where are the dentists? Where's the receptionist? Who's going to manage this? That link was not made. So this very expensive building was built. Never used. You find that all over the world, Pakistan, famous. Go to a hospital, remote area, all chained up, all the stuff inside. The link is not made. And unfortunately, this happens too, too often because we don't link disasters with development. And I think we're going to spend time talking about that. Okay? And just this top one, this is, oh, this is a real shame. This was a school, okay? and the school was rebuilt after the earthquake. This is back in Gujarat, okay, 2001. It's a pretty good school. We looked around the school. People don't want to use the school. They're scared of the school, and that building is going to be demolished. Now, that building is perfectly safe. It's perfectly strong, but little cracks. You can just see at the top there, there are little cracks in the cement. Now, buildings crack. It's called settlement. It's normal, OK? They're not structural. It's a perfectly safe building. But you imagine, if you were a parent who lost your child or your neighbors lost a child in the last building that fell down, they build a new building and there are cracks in it. The trauma, we talk about trauma, I forget who it was, we talk about trauma and memory. I, I, you know, you wouldn't send your kids to a building with cracks. And so people are so scared, they are having the building knocked down, even though the building is fine. Okay? So we can forget this. We can forget these little things, okay, which mean that our, our well-meaning investments become a waste of money. And, and we, we, we don't learn very well, I would suggest, in post-disaster recovery. All right, okay, now I want to shift a little bit to this next one. And I, I, yeah, okay, I want to apologize. I'm going to put a diagram up, but we're going to talk about it for the group that we're working with in the afternoon. Um, it's, it's too much to put up as one, one diagram, but we'll spend time talking about this. I would have drawn it. But what I would just want to say on this, that in this approach, you put people in the middle, okay, and we build up. And what stands between us and bad things happening, just focus on this bit, our skills and our abilities and our knowledge and our networks and our education and our alliances and our friends, okay? And what stands between us and bad things happening in a disaster are all those things. So if we're in a safe building, there's less risk of a disaster. If we have networks and friends that help us, who can lend money and borrow and all those things, okay? So again, I almost don't want to put this up because it's too complicated as a diagram, just to put it up like that, okay? 
But I just want to say to you that good development work, good disaster management work, good recovery work, everything that's often thought to be good about how we recover from disaster is about building and using skills, abilities, networks, belongings, all these different things. Okay, we call them assets. We talked about social assets earlier. Okay. All right, let me move on from that. Because <laughs> it's too complicated. All right. So just to talk a little bit about an example, if you think about putting people in the middle, uh, when you think about your planning and your organizing, how would you do that? I'd just like to share with you one example. There are lots of good examples, but this is just one I would suggest quite, is quite a good example. This is the same place I put up before the break. This is Shimla in uh, northern India in Himachal Pradesh. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But it's also very, very frightening, all right? Because this city is at risk of disaster, and earthquakes in the Himalayas are everywhere. And this is just where we're talking about up here. The darker the red, the more risk of earthquake. And in that part of northern India, it's very risky, okay, very mountainous. There was a very big earthquake, the Kangra earthquake in 1905, killed about 20,000 people, and Shimla pretty much fell down, okay, this beautiful city. There are some 200,000 people there now. People think they come every 100 years. No one really knows. Earthquakes are very hard to predict, but people think more or less, you know, we're overdue. You hear that very often in a lot of places, so pinch of salt, crying wolf, okay? But it is, we can agree, a dangerous area. Now, Shimla is not prepared very well for an earthquake. These buildings are really quite frightening to be in. And you can see here, you know, the buildings stay up until they fall down. It sounds a silly thing to say. But the land shifts. And can you see, can you can see the land that slipped here? Well, there are people living in that building where the shadow is. There are people living in that house, that building. And people aren't stupid. I mean, they're not thick. But people will live somewhere because for money or for closeness of work or for risk or whatever it is, okay? But these buildings are, are dangerous. Now, this is very scary, you know? This building, you could almost push it over. <laughs> it's amazing, look how it's been built. Now, one of the reasons this happens is because, I mean, India's amazing. It has some of the best building regulations in the world, okay? But the problem is how you enforce them, okay? So if the fine, if you build that building and the fine for doing it is a tiny amount of money. Well, forget it, forget it, just ignore it, okay? So you just keep building. So the regulations, the, the, the enforcing of regulations isn't good enough. They exist, they're not enforced. And you see that all over the world. The lack of enforcement of regulations is the issue, not having them. It's how you put them into practice. So this is a very dangerous city, okay? So what do you do about that? Well, what, would you, what would you do about that? You're now the mayor of Shimla, what would you do? Isn't there a simple answer? <laughs> no. No, so no. One by one. I said one by one. One by one? Yeah, so you would just start somewhere. Start somewhere. Just start somewhere, yeah, good answer. So you would just start somewhere, yeah? Yeah? I, I, sorry. Oh. <laughs> you no, got the answer. I'm, no, I mean, I, I want to suggest moving the people to another better built area, but yeah. then again, as we mentioned before, maybe people might not want to move away from their work yeah. and the, their neighborhood. Yeah, so, so, so an answer could be rebuild somewhere else. Uh, yeah, and many people have proposed that for other places, and there are histories of cities that have been abandoned over the years for lack of water or for climate changes or whatever. Um, it's unlikely it will happen for the reasons you, you, you cite. People don't want to, and it's costly. It's just too expensive. It just won't happen. You know, our, our awareness is good after a disaster, but before is pretty low. So maybe you have to create uh, workforces, all, I mean, in other places, so people will move voluntarily. So they find an economic situation that are favorable to live there. So they will move voluntarily because they find work and things. Yeah. And maybe you can plan that, that way better. But yeah. you have to create the, the, the work source. Okay, yeah, so create, employ create the incentives to go somewhere else. Yeah, well, that's a thought. Okay, so well, what, what has actually happened these last few years is not a lot, is the first thing to say, but some very small things. Now, as a piece of work a few years ago, a couple of us interviewed all the building inspectors, the people in charge of, in charge of um, you know, knowing about this stuff. Not one had any knowledge of seismic engineering, of what to do to strengthen a building. 
And when you see some new government buildings are taller than they should be according to the building codes, the incentive to do this, to get it right, is, is less because you don't see anybody else doing it. So one by one would be nice. You start somewhere, okay? So what this NGO did, this is, um, this is a real project. And if you look up this project, it was highlighted as a very good project three years ago by United Nations as a really good project. And it's a very simple project. It's called the School Earthquake Safety Initiative, Shimla, CSIS. All good projects have good acronyms, <laughs> CSIS. And it was funded by ECHO and Christian Aid. And it was um, put together by this non-governmental organization called Seeds India, who were very good. All their approaches put people in the middle, okay, and work outwards in a developmental way. So I suggest look them up. They're very good at what they do, very thoughtful, okay. And what they thought is, and, and they had the same issue, where do you start, what do you do? Now this project was around hearts and minds, about people being aware of earthquakes and what to do. So they would know to escape, to be prepared, they would have it in their heads. And this organization thought it would be good to start with children. One, because of vulnerability, population growth, more kids, safety, but also teaching parents, you know, building a culture of safety. If we build a culture of safety as individuals, we reduce the risk. I think that's, that's pretty safe to say, okay? But also, cleverly, this NGO wanted to influence the government, okay? They wanted to make a successful project that was high profile and then push the government to do something about, about reducing risk in Shimla, okay? To have a state-level disaster management plan. Because at that time, there wasn't a state-level disaster management plan. And this project worked towards touching on government. Remember the recommendation from Haiti? Recommendation one, always try and work with government. This is what this project sought to do, work with government and, and, and you know, be helpful to government to push to get a plan. OK, so what did they do? Just three, four things, OK? This first one, the, the big thing, a culture of disaster, culture of safety. You know where the exits are. You know what to do. Everybody knows it. We don't have to think if a disaster happens. We do it, and we know where to go. Very simple stuff, but if you don't do that, that's lives. You know, that's how it happens. You, you wait a few seconds, that's how it happens. Okay, to prepare school disaster management plans. Where do you put the safety? Where do you put the secure things that you might need, the blankets? Who talks to who on the telephone if there's a disaster? To have a plan of action ready, okay? Um, to set up committees and task forces in schools to be responsible. So you would say, who's responsible for fire? It might be you. You know, who's responsible for, you know, blankets and things? It might be you, and you'll have training in that, and you can evacuate people, okay? And these, these are clumsy words. Structural means strengthening buildings. Non-structural just means the things on walls, things, things that might fall over and, and collapse on you, okay? Okay. All right, just, so just a few bits. Now, this project, it wanted to be high profile. No good if it's one school. Who cares? You've done one school. That's nice. But it's, that's not enough. There are hundreds of thousands of schools in, you know, probably in India. So start with Shimla. Uh, and just do a few places that are high profile. Do, I think they did 15, 16, something like that. Knowing there are hundreds or more. OK. And what they tried to do was to do two things. One is have strong buildings. Because you can see that. It's very visible to see stuff and take the minister to look at the buildings and convince him. It's almost always a him, not always. Um, and then also capacity building. That's skills, knowledge, all those things. You know, it's a clumsy word, capacity building, but just skills. OK? And that was through education and training, planning, implementing. And this is through straight physical works. OK, so just a bit on the, And what did they do? How did they build the capacity? OK? Well, they did an awful lot of, spent a lot of time with people, a lot of training, a lot of skill sharing, OK? So they spent a lot of time with teachers. You know, how do teachers get involved? What constitutes the high profile? What constitutes the high profile? I mean, is it population or is it money? Where cool. are those sections? Uh, high in, well, I can tell you what I meant by saying that. High profile meaning that the senior people in government could be invited to go see the, the good work of an organization and the things that they could do. And if you win the heart and the mind of the politician, then he, she sometimes, might then go do it somewhere else. 
It's a kind of advocacy. Yeah, it just looked like the map was in distinct little clusters. I'm wondering why. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, that was a, right, oh, no, I'm with you. That was a combination of schools that were willing to do it. Um, okay, so schools that said yes, you didn't have to do it. It was an NGO project, not a government project. So schools willing to do it. What the project could do with the money, because it wasn't, it was, I forget, half a million dollars. That's not a lot of money. What you could do, something like that. Okay, and then I think also in Shimla City, it's close to the seat of government, and that helped. So a combination of factors. Okay, and again, you can find the reports of this on the web. Just Google CSIS India and you'll find it. It's really easy to get. Okay, so this one, uh, disaster awareness on students and teachers. Again, what do you do in an earthquake? You run, you duck, you cover, all that kind of stuff. Very simple. Practicing drills as well. <laughs> Did they take into consideration the local people over there? Like to put it into the culture because you cannot just enforce something which John is not in the culture like have we seen with the buildings? Yes, no, well said. Yes, it's uh, absolutely. Uh, I should have said SEED is an Indian organization. The entire team bar one is Indian uh, and all the interactions are, you know, in Hindi. Uh, so it's, it's, an, in, it's an Indian project if you like. Uh, that said, I mean, it's an organization from Delhi working in Himachal Pradesh, which is some distance away. So to, to link locally is vital, because if you don't do that, then you're sunk here, yeah? the imposition of external ideas. So a lot of this was around, well, you might see here, actually. In fact, this was the, the one non-Indian person on the program. I think this woman's Italian, to my best memory, uh, and she was working on the project, too. But I spent a lot of time listening. If you spend a lot of time listening, and not speaking. That's a really good approach. Best programming approach. Don't say anything for ages. <laughs> I mean it. Just listen. It's really good. Okay. Uh, this was just on training, on how do you make shelves safe, stuff like that. Very, very, very straightforward stuff. But still training, you know. And then mock drill, evacuation. What do you do? Get out. And it's made to be fun as well. I mean, obviously, we're talking about something very serious. And in the trainings, the activities, however, we can have fun, we can laugh and giggle and run around and, and it becomes, um, a, a game is the wrong word, but you know, it's not sort of, oh, it's all really terrible, okay? It becomes part of a, a culture that we can, we can do something positive, okay? You can do something positive, you can, be, you can have power over a bad event, okay? That's important. Now this stuff, you know, it's all sort of high profile, it's very formal, it's around status, it's dull. <laughs> but you know, but it's important because it's around it's, you know, an air of importance, you know, that we're giving this a weight, you know, it feels important. And maybe they were talking about good things too. But, um, <laughs> all right. Okay, this is pretty straightforward. Um, just strengthening buildings. This is a, this is a great picture. No, I mean, it's not my picture. Uh, but it was around these people. These are masons. These are builders, local builders who make things. Now, it's almost a certainty that these people almost certainly didn't have any formal education. I, I don't know, but my, my strong guess is that's the case. We'll have learned to trade from probably a parent or somebody else, and some will be good and some will be bad. But almost all building practices very often forget about earthquake, okay? Because it was 100 years ago, forget it, you know? And there are some very simple principles, okay, that you can make buildings strong. They're actually very simple. You put a beam at the top that you tie it together, put a beam at the bottom, they're called ring beams. Okay, you, 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 put, you don't put things in the corners, openings, some people are knowing this. You know, there are simple, three or four very simple practices that will greatly reduce the risk. Not totally, but will reduce the risk. So this is training these masons, okay? And if you look at the Seeds Masons Associations, they're throughout India, they've gone into Afghanistan, they were down in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands after the tsunami, and they're really good. And they're about training local people just very simple building practices, community level, if you like, local builders, all right, to be better at what you do. And that stuff stays with people and is great. So, yeah, just very straightforward, strengthening schools. This would be a not untypical school building in this part of India, in Himachal Pradesh. Okay, then public awareness. This was important. An awful lot of public awareness materials on disaster management, on what to do, some scientific-looking stuff, because that's good, because I'm... Because, because it's good. It also has a technical side to it. And then also, this one is really important. Um, this was held on the 100th anniversary of the Kangra earthquake uh, and was high profile. And in the center of 
Shimla, there's this big open market square, and it was high profile, it was making a noise. How can we talk about this? We have the power to do something positive and, and all those things, okay? So that was a meeting that this NGO put together. And I think that's my last slide, actually. Yeah, so in summary, uh, reduce the damage from a disaster, put the people in the middle, not the disaster. Sounds dumb, but I promise you, too often we don't do that. So maybe that's a good slide just to keep up there and to say that we do have happily some time for a discussion, really, and some conversations. Yeah, actually, I would like to make a remark. Uh, I think we all should feel um, happy and privileged to, to be here today, not only in the sense that we're having David, but to, to be able to have this level of education you guys have. Because you guys are studying renewable energies, you guys are studying the MIGMA, you guys the IMSD, and this is an example of how we can all contribute with our skills, with the things we know, because these type of disasters can happen anywhere, anytime. Uh, think about the Lorca um, earthquake we had, what, three months ago? I don't know when it was exactly. And uh, everyone can contribute. You guys are going to be in the future, in the government, in the private sector, in, the, in an NGO if you want, from, from all those areas, you can contribute with not only your will, but with your skills, with the knowledge you're getting here this year and the past years you had uh, to solve the different problems. So everything is fractal uh, and, and everything is an addition of, of the, indiv the individual attitudes and, and uh, suggestions we all can make. So, uh, so just, it's just a personal remark. Mm. I don't know if you have questions. I think it's, it's a privilege to have David, so take, take the most of it. Ask him questions. There's, I think there's one down here. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, uh, I was wondering if security counts in, this, um, in these issues, because for ex I, I, I asked this because in Venezuela, for example, insecurity issues have made people to put uh, uh, walls and um, uh, fences in between the windows, inclusively, so in case of an earthquake, people are trapped. I mean, we're building prisons inside our houses. Yes. And in the case of a disaster, people might, feel, might be trapped not to have exits because it, they're, they're blocked. So are these uh, kind of social issues taken into consideration when disaster comes? That's a great question. That's a re did, you, did you get that? You know, th uh, to be able to get out of a building, if you've got security and, and fences and things, it's much harder. Well, all I can... Uh, I'm just thinking how to think about that. Uh, yes has to be the answer, of course. I, I'm not aware of any great research on that. There probably is, because there's research on almost everything. But it would certainly stand to reason that in societies where there's more fear and more risk, and where there are earthquakes, and people are stuck in buildings and they collapse and there are fires, it would be surprising if there's not a link uh, that's not a positive one. Is my observation of what you say. Okay, thank you. But in your experience in Venezuela, I mean, well, uh, Venezuela, say we, more. we don't suffer like really much of earthquakes, even though uh, in uh, an average of 60 years we should have one. Mm. And 60 years ago, we didn't have the insecurity issues we have now. Mm. And I see and see the, the the buildings, you know, and I see all the all the fences buildings in between the the balconies and then the windows. And I, and I wonder, like, oh, if an earthquake comes again, because it it, it comes, it's studied that it comes so mm. 60 years in average. So what will people do? How can people go out from the buildings? It's, but it's a social issue. It's something external from the disaster itself, but it has influence. Absolutely. No, it, it totally has influence. One of, the, one of the issues in Haiti right now are people living in high-rise buildings, okay? And those high-rise buildings for some were very poor and, and people were renting rooms. You know, these were sometimes poorer people. Some of those buildings collapsed. Now, where do those people go now? You know, an assumption of an agency might be to rebuild a house. And so you need land for that. You've got a plot that's the, the size of this. But there were 30 families on that plot living five stories high some of whom were renting the space. So wh where do they go and what do they do? I'm touching on the social, I'm weaving in what you're saying around social issues, around what are the responses and the recoveries. And I would suggest it's not like anybody knows. It's not like anybody has said, this is the answer of what we do now. There are emerging lessons, the Interagency Standing Committee, the IASC, which is a UN body, uh, is putting together an urban toolkit. 
but still it's slow and it's far behind and well it's not slow it's very good but it's still not got to grips with what do we do around rebuilding in a disaster because of these social issues if you were the UNHCR High Commissioner for Refugees and you were involved in an urban area where a building is 10 stories and had just been damaged like that do you spend your entire budget rebuilding a block of flats that, that that's a real issue that's a real problem real situation do you rebuild a block of flats or do you do something else and we're faced with a lot of these social issues of density and squatter settlements and low-income areas are a game changer and if you find yourselves working in this area first do so because it's incredibly interesting but also bring different aspects and different perspectives and different disciplines because you get people from all different disciplines. I trained as an architect. I don't really use architecture. On our course, we have doctors, lawyers, vets, and nurses, people with no formal education, aid workers, everything you could think of. And everybody brings a different perspective and a different view because it's not like there are any straight answers to these problems. It's an interesting time. I think there's uh, two hands at the back there. Do you think the territorial management plan can diminish the impacts on disasters? I'm sorry, I didn't, do I think, sorry? Like the territorial management plans, do you think these plans can diminish the, uh, the effects on the, of the disasters in communities? All right. These are these... Sorry, I, I didn't catch. Sorry. No, uh, no, I'm talking, for example, like these plans municipality do does, for example, in for instance, in order, like for example, okay, this area you should not build here because oh, you can. Yeah, the urban no, it's, it's zoning. Is it zoning? Yeah, yeah, it's like more uh, the management of the territory in a community. For example, for instance, this area you it's destined for for you know harvest yeah nice. and this one uh, you have to build here because you're you're far away from a river or you're not in this yeah. uh, cliff that can you know like but i wonder if these things can actually help to prevent the effects on a natural disaster now i'm with you good question no, th th and thank you for that um yes has to be the answer there needs to be a level of management around places that are vulnerable the images i showed you from sendai from Japan, those areas, that town is not going to be rebuilt. That's going to be zoned now as an industrial use area. And because Japan can afford this, uh, and because they're very clever at this, that town is going to go somewhere else now. That's pretty unusual. But that place is thought to be too dangerous now to live in. But we, we, the government of Japan has decided they can sacrifice industrial use. So that area is being rezoned. After the tsunami, 2004, um, the, the great big one in Asia, Sri Lanka is coastal zone. I, forget, I think 100 meters, but I might be wrong. Uh, the coastal zone was said, you won't rebuild there anymore, okay, because it's too dangerous. What has happened though, two things, well, many things. One is fishing people resent that, because where do you, where do you live as fishing communities? But what has happened, you, you might be knowing this story, that some hotels have sprung up and there has been rebuilding. So there are ways around it, which, you know, um, there it is. So zoning, th there has to be zoning. But the reality, you know, the, the enforcement of zoning can be difficult and overcome. And it, of course, it always ties back to government and governance. The, the power to enforce regulation, uh, fairness, which is not always the case. And real, real huge complexities. Great, there, there's one here. There was, there was another one here, wasn't there, first? I about the, um, the project CISIS. Mm. How do you approach the schools? Like, because I'm wondering if you let the, um, the teachers or the, the students with the fear, scary feelings, or they would be feeling that they are a bit upset about the government not taking mm. care of them. Mm. How do you convince them to, take it, to be part of this project, get you on board? Uh, to my best knowledge, when SEEDS did their assessments, they approached schools and asked them would they like to be involved. And it was a yes or a no. And I think if it was a yes, then they undertook some surveys of the school buildings to see which could be strengthened and which not. And it was this idea of a demonstration project. And there, I mean, many people say there are too many demonstration projects that don't turn into things. 
and that's certainly true. Um, this one, to my best understanding, did have an influence in terms of promoting a state-level disaster management plan. And I, I'm not aware people in schools are particularly saying the government's doing nothing for us. Uh, it was just an opportunity to, to, to push a little bit further, making some action. Because people forget, you know, disasters are every hundred years. You've got everyday life to get on with. And if there are a hundred years, there's every chance it won't happen in your lifetime. So why would I care? Uh, India is changing, you know, but it still has among the highest number of poor people in the world living in one country, if not the highest. So there are still issues. So there are plenty of other problems and everyday issues to deal with. And that's one of the problems in disaster management. We forget the big thing that can happen. You know, one second can change everything. And if we forget that one second, then that's a problem. You know, heaven forbid something very bad might happen here in the next 10 minutes. Heaven forbid. But, you know, that's how it happens when people don't expect it. I have a question about how to solve or manage the gap between the short term needs, for example, in a humanitarian disaster like, um, I don't know, Haiti, and the issues that need more long term, for example, development issues. Yes. The, these programs of Shimla, it's like more preventive. Yes. And seems to have more uh, long term run. Yes. And it's, it's reminding me the, the issue that you told about the buildings. In a humanitarian, you need to give houses to the people, but you you are in like a trade-off between you need to build shelters more easy, more cheap, more mm. quick, or houses. But if you build strong houses, you need to reconstruct the urban planning thing, the city. Yes. So how can you solve the gap between in a humanitarian disaster? It's a, it's it's always it's yeah. Like Does anyone have the answer? <laughs> <laughs> Because it's a great question, and it's been the same question for 40 years. And one of the issues is we don't care until the disaster happens, and then it's very visible, and a lot of money comes, and that's, that's good. I mean, it's good. It's good to have response to a disaster. You're overwhelmed and you need a response. So you get a lot of money that comes, and then it has to be spent very quickly, you know, uh, because that's the way the system's set around political cycles of donors almost always the case. Uh, it needs to be spent very quickly, but the, the problems and the solutions are long-term. And we know that's the classic problem, and it is a problem, unless and until that changes, we are doomed to repeat. Things are getting better in the last 10 years. You know, we talk about disasters as a development concern. We never talked about that until 10 years ago in the last 10 years. Well, we did, but not, not as much profile. So it is changing, and there's a lot of people saying this. If you said enough, maybe, then something might change. But you, you put your finger on what is the classic problem. An NGO, a, a, an NGO in Pakistan, okay, there was the Kashmir earthquake, 2005, six, five, five, um, the Kashmir earthquake. This NGO, in 50 years of its history, had never had a budget of more than oh, half a million dollars, some, something like that, uh, maybe as little more, two, two, three million maybe. Overnight almost, $26 million came through the post. Poof. Then another 17 million comes a few months later. Now, this organization that had 80 good people has to go up to 600 people, okay? Imagine finding, after a disaster, another 500 skilled people in a marketplace, you know, where other NGOs are operating and prices are going up. And then they have to be super good and brilliant and technical at what they do for a couple of years, and then they get the sack. <laughs> and then they're out. And that, that's the spike of the funding and the money and the human resources and, and the work 24-7, you know, night and day. And it's, it's part of the dilemmas and the problems and the challenges. But it needs people to think this through and get better at it, you know? I think this is what's happening uh, with uh, the problem of climate change. Until it's not visible, but I'm, I'm yes. not meaning visible in the developing countries, which is already. But in cities like New York, London, Madrid, until this problem is really not more visible, I don't know if we're, we're, we're going to do anything like properly. Yes. So I think I don't know if it's a condition of humankind, and I don't know if we are going to evolve someday, but I think it's really the the base, the, mm. the same problem. Mm. My question was about uh, what you said that we have to keep the cities, uh, the population of the cities, dense, mm. because when I think about it, um, when the population is dense, the disease spread much easier. Uh, when a disaster happens, more people get killed, 
and so on and so on. So eventually, are there more advantages of uh, dense cities than disadvantages? Uh, I mean, what you touch on is true. I mean, all the thinking is that dense cities are more efficient uh, around use of energy. I mean, one of the vast challenges we have right now is energy use. Uh, I mean, we have endless challenges, food use, energy use, endless challenges, more so than ever before with our population growth globally. Uh, the, the, the wisdom is the dense cities is a good thing, compact cities. If you look at, again, UN Habitat, I was just there last week, and, and all their thinking is around make cities dense because of efficiency of transport and of movement and of temperatures and blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is thought to be the right thing for lots of good reasons. My question kind of relates to that because I was going to ask, you, you mentioned urbanization and how it's increasing at a rapid pace, mm. but that also creates a lot of problems because then people create, make houses which are not strong, mm -hmm. the shanty towns and so on. So do you think in order to prevent future disasters from having a big negative effect, should governments focus more on the policy of urbanization and preventing so many people moving into the cities? Yeah, no, great question. And again, that, that's been one that's gone on for years and it has been the policy of um, the, well, the almost written policy, at least of one big country, with urbanization happening quickly some years ago was don't make the sums nicer because more people will come. Imagine what that means. Keep it horrid. It's not, it's not nice, is it? It's not a good policy. You know? And it might, I mean, you know, South America, is it, is it Peru? Others will know this better than I, about the building of satellite cities, secondary city policies to prevent the bigger cities getting bigger and growth in secondary cities and creating satellites through those. But you know what? The game has changed now because there are three causes for urban growth. One is people being born in cities. that They didn't come from anywhere. They were born in the city. Secondly, people moving into them. And thirdly, cities gobbling up, growing. But certainly now, the, the vast increase of people being born, they, they, they didn't come from anywhere, except from their mothers. And that, that's home for them. Uh, so there's nowhere else to go. So it's happened. It's happened, and it won't change. The demographic shifts happening in the world mean you know cities are going to grow by couple of billion, is it? Something like that. 1.3, I forget, but it's going to grow massively. And it's a million people a week. And stopping it is not an option, really. So, but do you see, do you see it as a really good thing or a bad thing? Is city growth good or is it bad? I mean... Depending on the way it's taken. So, depending on the way it's taken. Do you think, it, is city growth a good thing? Depends on the city. Depends on the city, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're talking about smart grids. In, in our class about renewable energy. And huh. I believe that if you create a city, depending on how you build the city, it can be a good thing, but yes. it can also be a bad thing yeah. as well. I mean, all, all countries that have done well on the planet uh, have gone through cities. If you take a city as an engine of growth, okay, city as engines of growth, of commerce and of the global markets, then, then they're a good thing. The government of Ethiopia for many years had a policy of rural-led. Are you knowing this policy? Rural-led growth. And it's not worked terribly well. A policy of rural-led growth is not, I mean, good for them for being brave, but it's not on the world scene of a global market. It's not, not where growth is. So if you want growth, it's urban. So guys, I think we run out of time. No more time for questions. Unless the Merme or Migma have, you have more questions? No? Laura, you're the Migma <laughs> representative. So your question is valid for the rest of the class. Wow, where's the, where's the coffee? Is that the question? Big <laughs> responsible. White no sugar. <laughs> I just I just like to know a little bit more about how is your job. I cannot, you know, like oh, I too. can imagine, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Yes, it's a. I think it's simple, but very big. I don't know. How's my job? How how is how what do you do uh, at your work mm -hmm. as a project management and disaster? You know? Oh, oh well, thanks for asking. Um, uh, well, I, I currently work in a university. Uh, with a master's degree, um, and then do it's some. Like me, but there. Yeah, exactly. I am Eva. <laughs> Eva Oxford. Well, Eva Oxford Brooks. I'm not traveling to Kenya. And to <laughs> um, I'm not sure how to answer it, really. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer your question. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I don't know if you, if you work more like teaching or more uh, in projects helping people, or I don't know how. I would say my, my background is working for an NGO and a disaster management consultancy and then these last five years in, in a university. And uh, what do you do when there is no, like, is there always like a disaster working or is it like more like planning or helping people to prevent? 
it's, it's, the, the, the big clues are in disaster risk reduction. It's in, it's in long term development work around reducing risk of it happening. And the best quote is that a successful disaster risk reduction is a sequence of non events. <laughs> if it works really well, nothing happens. But that's quite a hard thing to sell. It's a good place to end, isn't it? <laughs> so thank you, David. No, thank you, and thank you, thank you for your patience.